You dedicate a lot of time to thinking about uh, physical activity and sarcopenia in older adults and ways to attenuate sarcopenia as someone ages. Sarcopenia may be a new term for some, so perhaps from the start here we we define that as a med- medical term. What does sarcopenia mean? Yeah, the term itself has sort of evolved. I first came across it in probably like the mid-90s um, and it started to have a bit of um, discussion at that point. And while it's evolved since then, the current definitions have focused on three aspects, muscle mass, muscle strength, and physical performance, uh, sometimes referred to as physical function. So different groups have come up with different definitions and diagnostic criteria. Perhaps the biggest in the world is the European Working Group. They've come out for second consensus a few years ago. And they look at muscle strength as the first level of diagnosis, then muscle mass, which is a little bit more difficult to measure precisely. Uh, So things like DEXA, uh, looking at that muscle mass quantity or quality, and then measures of physical performance, which are often sit to stand or gait speed um, are typical measures. And I forgot, sorry, for strength, the sit to stand can be used, but often the hand grip um, is used as the, the simplest form of strength assessment just because of its simplicity and the fact that it does seem to associate with total body strength well in in many populations. And what is more, I guess, predictive of good long-term health or a low risk of falls or or fracture and mortality? Is it it muscle mass? Is it strength? Or is it physical, function, or some combination of these? Uh, All three um, have strong relationships with a host of adverse events in older adults. So potentially now more so with the change in definition of the muscle strength, that is perhaps focused on a little bit more. So muscle strength obviously underpins human performance to a large extent. And the work we do in athletic populations in strength conditioning, that's the basis for that entire field of improving athletic performance by doing work in the gym, for example. But in saying that, um, if your gait speed in particular or your inability to get out of a chair is present, your life uh, is pretty compromised. If you can't get out of a chair without assistance or if it if you can get out and it feels almost like a one repetition maximum squat uh, for people at that threshold of strength and function, they don't get out of their chair very much. And if they walk quite slowly, um, so there's a sarcopenic threshold of 0.8 meters per second, which is around half the sort of speed a typical 20 to 30 year old would just walk around at a a regular pace. So as your gait speed gets lower than that, it again makes it difficult to mobilize, uh, crossing roads with potentially two lanes each way. Muscle mass underpins all of those things. And independently, it's really important for things like um, hospitalizations. So if you've got cancer or other conditions with associated with muscle wasting, uh, hip fractures, the unfortunate statistics where the mortality rates are relatively high for people with hip fractures in extended hospital care, again, muscle mass and even fat mass is important to to survive those, um, those contexts. So to say one is more important than the other, um, while research groups do focus potentially in one of those three aspects, my view, they're all interrelated and important, but potentially for a given person at a given point of time, you could make a case one is a bit more important than the other two. So that's where the diagnostic tests, I guess, on an individual level then inform exercise prescription based on what are the particular stimuli that might might be most beneficial for an individual. Correct, because I suppose like even if we look at younger adults, you can still see somewhat of a mismatch between muscle mass, strength, and physical function. Um, It's not just the absolutely huge jacked bodybuilder who is best at a whole range of things or necessarily is even the strongest. And we see that in sports like powerlifting or weightlifting, where sometimes the best athletes just don't look as physically impressive, but they've got maybe anthropometric or neurological advantages, technical as well. So, yeah, it's because I suppose the fact that sarcopenia is still a relatively new condition uh, in terms of public and scientific research, 
identifying those most important characteristics for different groups or individuals is still very much in its infancy. And sometimes it just get, gets down to the, the particular person or patient, what do they feel is most important for them? I think that's actually a good way of looking at this. So if we step into the shoes of someone that's in their 60s or 70s or 80s, what is it that they're looking for? And of the three things you listed, mass, strength, physical function, I have to presume physical function. People want to be able to navigate their environment, sit to stand, walk up and down hills, all of these things confidently and and effectively. Yeah, so that physical function that then impacts their independence and quality of life uh, is probably the biggest driver we see in the literature, but also in the exercise programs I've been involved with here in Australia and in New Zealand historically uh, that have long um, engagement for these older adults in exercise programs. So it's asking these individuals, in essence, why have you joined this gym or why are you considering exercise? What is the the things that you want to maintain or what are you potentially starting to lose the ability to do now and then the exercise prescription that is developed particularly after maybe the first eight to 12 weeks which is quite basic and sort of just introduces them familiarizes them to a gym minimizes delayed onset muscle soreness example for examples but after that sort of first three months then the prescription becomes a bit more specific to their goals what they want to improve while also taking into account any um, contraindications they might have with their medical history or, or injury history. Hey friends, the scientific evidence on lifestyle habits that lead to longevity is clear. Now it's time to put this knowledge into action. I'm excited to announce the Living Proof Longevity Challenge, a 12 week program to build evidence-based lifestyle habits to optimize longevity. My team and I have transformed over hundreds of hours of conversations with experts on aging, nutrition, and exercise into a life-changing 12-week program that will challenge you to develop habits that lead to a longer, better life. This is a unique opportunity to gather health data about yourself that has the potential to change your life for the better. You'll start by testing 10 longevity biomarkers that tell the truth about where your longevity stands right now, today. Following that, you'll get a personalized longevity score to guide your 12 weeks of habit building that will boost your score and improve your biomarkers for the better. After the challenge, you'll retest your 10 biomarkers and see the proof of how powerful these science-backed habits really are. Head over to theproof.com forward slash living proof to download your zero cost copy of the Living Proof Longevity Challenge today. That's theproof.com forward slash living proof. Look forward to joining you on this journey. If we were to maybe take this a, a step further and think about physical function, whether it's sit to stand or walking and think about what contributes to someone's ability to do those successfully, mm -hmm. how much of that does come down to strength? How much of that does come down to muscle size, to balance and coordination, confidence? That is, to a certain extent, some of the holy grail of this level of research. The biggest challenge is potentially, if we think of levels of strength or balance as maybe thresholds of physical function, um, and those levels of strength might need to be normalized to your body mass in some way as well. Once someone is reaching those sort of thresholds of that performance, then that might become the biggest driving factor. So. If they, if someone is in essence got good balance, has good sensory system like vision, proprioception, vestibular function, but their lower body strength is poor, then their ability to sit to stand and walk or even stand is going to be compromised. So for that person, um, a lower body resistance intervention would be great. Alternatively, we can also see perhaps the traditional approach of working for older adults as being machine based to a point in that it's perceived to be safer than free weights or body weight exercises. And I remember reading a meta-analysis years ago, I can't recall the name of the authors or anything, probably 10 years ago. My daughters are now 15 and 12. Um, so it might've been seven or eight years ago. And I read through the meta-analysis and all these resistance training programs had no effect on older adults' balance. I then just read a little bit more detail the actual 
interventions that were the resistance training, and they were all machine-based. So leg press, leg extension, leg curl, where you're seated. And I asked my daughters who are in primary school all the time, do you think doing strength exercises while seating will improve um, balance of grandma? And they said, no, why would it? They're sitting down. So sometimes it's as simple as that, that our exercise prescriptions, if they're too simplistic um, and they're all seated exercises, we're going to get quite a unidimensional sort of benefit like strength and some level muscle mass. So the programs I've been associated with that have done well have integrated balance and resistance training in a progressive fashion. Some programs will have those two arms quite separate. Others will incorporate what you'd consider a more functional strength and conditioning based progression where things like squats and lunges and deadlifts and cable rotations and step ups, step downs, lunges, or even carries like, in essence, farmers carries and things like that, which simulate carrying the groceries in or things in the garden are included in the program. So you've got that overload of the muscle and bone with the the loads that are lifted, but also the the balance requirements and the, the mobility as well. So we still don't have clear evidence on how effective those are necessarily to other approaches, but If we think of young adults and strength conditioning, we typically get better results from that approach than just leg press, leg extension, et cetera. I don't want to skip forward too much here, but it it seems relevant. Is this the challenge with community-based programs and guidelines? You're you're going out and giving broad recommendations and then at, at an individual level like you just spoke to before, it might be that for person A, their risk of falls is greatly increased by balance issues. Uh, person B, it's lower limb strength and, and so forth. So when you're creating these kind of broad community programs, my assumption is that you're going in with a kind of multi, multimodal type program that's hopefully catering for everyone. Yeah, that's often the case that many programs are trying to tick off a host of physical and then mobility and social benefits. The question can be, if we look at sort of the guidelines and the evidence of what constitutes a minimum effective dosage, by, to some extent, looking to improve lots of things, are we diluting the benefit of perhaps the most important characteristics that these programs need to focus on? And then identifying which clients will most likely benefit from one program versus another, it's probably still most healthcare systems or exercise um, sort of facilities might not quite be at that level as yet. To, in essence, identify what is the optimal or the best options for that person at that point of time. Do you have a sense, though, I guess, again, at a population level, not an individual level, if you were looking at risk factors for falls, fractures, premature death, is it lower limb strength that most people would need to work on? Is it balance? What do you think would the, the, the kind of number one risk factor would be? To me, I'd probably go to that lower limb strength and balance would be the two things that typically underpin the loss of function and the dependency that is associated with some people as they age. Uh, We've often focused on cardiovascular disease and those sort of metabolic and obesity sort of measures, which is still important. But if we're thinking of physical function, perhaps strength, particularly relative to your body weight and then your balance, I would say based on what I've read and the programs I've been involved with are, are the two key things to include in an exercise prescription. Okay. And so then coming back to sarcopenia, that becomes important with this loss of strength that you're speaking about. What is the, what's the time scale of sarcopenia? When does it typically start? <laughs> that again is a question that is, has been examined in quite a bit of the, the studies. It's not something that we definitively know, but I suppose, again, if we look at those different aspects, the, the muscle mass, the strength and the function, some of those characteristics will probably start declining in people in their 40s. And that might, again, be dependent on their wider health lifestyles, their physical activity, nutrition, et cetera. I'm now approaching uh, 50. That's just a couple of months away. 
Um, still trying to keep strong, uh, do jujitsu and things like that. But yeah, not quite at the peak I was in my 30s in strongman. But the big thing, I suppose, is what ages do these things really become noticeable? And really, we start to think of probably into the 50s or, or 60s at a population level that decline starts to accelerate. And it's that how quickly that rate of acceleration occurs really impacts the quality of life in your in your latter years so being strong and functional early similar to osteoporosis like we have the public health um, promotion now of increasing bone mass in younger age where you're most um, able to some of the current evidence again is now suggesting that it's it's a great idea to get strong and improve your muscle mass in your teens and your 20s so the decline actually starts from a higher level of function and muscle mass so even if you still lose 20 or 30 percent of what you had as your peak you're still not approaching that level of disability which is akin to saving for your retirement exactly in saying that if individuals haven't in essence banked that muscle mass and strength and and bone mass in their 20s and 30s we still see lots of literature that even untrained people into their 80s and 90s can still improve their muscle strength appreciably and their function with resistance training, particularly if it does have some balance component. Muscle mass is probably less receptive to change, though, than those two other factors. So muscle strength will improve to the greatest extent, particularly in the exercises that you performed. Function will improve as well, but not to the same extent, which reflects specificity. And then muscle mass, while it can still improve or at least be maintained compared to the controls who aren't, is much more challenging to change as we age. Would that be the least important, though, of the three? If we were thinking about improving strength, mass, or physical function, would strength and physical function be of most importance anyway? I would agree with that. And outside, again, of that sort of those patient cases in hospital settings where muscle wasting is a potential um, mortality risk, I would definitely agree with that, that strength and physical performance are the two key factors to maintain with aging. Yeah, I think if anyone was going to push back a little bit there, I have heard some people talk about the importance of muscle mass for metabolic health. Mm-hmm, acting as a exactly, kind of yep. you know, site for glucose disposal. Mm-hmm. So it's still it's still obviously important. Still important. That's still, and that's been that sort of link, I suppose, to cardiovascular metabolic health diseases. Um, so it's definitely important. But yeah, putting me on the spot in terms of function and de- independence, um, that strength and physical performance are, are the key measures. And I think my sort of take on aging is, I still would like to be in my 70s and 80s and still being able to do the activities around the house, go to the gym, um, do stuff with the grandkids, great grandkids, if that would happen. Um, So that's often those sort of motives we hear from these older clients we've had in the programs that the things that have brought meaning to their life can be like, again, in Australia, uh, in the time I spent in New Zealand, there's a real culture of men doing it themselves, DIY, fixing things around the house, doing stuff in the shed. So that group in their 70s and 80s now still really, a lot of the men's identities around those sort of abilities. So if they lose that strength and physical function or their balance and can't do those things or their healthcare provider thinks it's unsafe for them to continue or perhaps their partner, then you're taking a big part of their life away from them and then that quality of life is is questionable at that point of time. And it's often a social interaction with with other people who share similar interests. The identity being tied into the physical function, that makes sense. Mm-hmm.